What's up, Crave? Uh, Jacob's here, along with Robsy and Kevin, and uh, we are going to get started with some worship, and we will have some fun. So we got some of the game and a great lesson brought to you by Kevin. So a lesson, a lesson. Well, I'm sure it's great. All right, we're going to get going. We're going to do uh, two songs today. We're going to do uh, Here Comes Heaven, uh, which we've done uh, before, like once or twice by Elevation Worship, and then a new song called Wait. So here we go. Children, we know more. Hope is on the horizon. We we will behold your promised Messiah. Angels, let your song begin. We come to. Strive 
God, thank you for the ability to still stay in connection with each other. Thank you for everyone who's tuning in right now um, and just uh, willing to hear a piece of what, what you have to say to us, God. We thank you for uh, the time that we get to have with each other, um, the connection we get to have. I pray that you work in this storm, God. I pray that you continue to work in the storm, work on us, um, and work on how we can be better vessels for you at the end of this. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, yeah, I will put this up real quick. All right, so it's my turn to bring some. Sit back a little bit here so you guys can get in the frame. And I will pull up my notes. Okay, 
So we're going to be bringing some uh, some hot facts. Well, four hot facts and two not hot facts. Uh, so we're going to do one, two, three, like we've done before. So I'm going to say three facts. I'm going to let Robsy and Kevin deliberate, and then they will uh, express to me uh, their decision. And you guys are also welcome to say one, two, or three in these uh, facts. So here we go. You guys ready? You guys, yeah, you guys ready. ready. All right. Yeah. All right. First fact. Did you know Expedia.com, Hotels.com, Hotwire.com, Trivago, Travelocity, Orbits are all owned by the same company? Yeah. Did you know? I believe that. Barbie's Ken was the first toy to be advertised on TV. That's, that's so weird it seems true. What's number three? And then February used to be the last month of the year, which is why it has the shortest number of days. No. Did I, you know? No, it's definitely, three is definitely the lie because Julius Caesar wanted more days in his year of July, and so he took it from February. Is that, put it in are you his. for real? Yeah, and that's why, that's I, why there's two days with 31s next, like two months uh, with 31s next to each other. I'm going to, I'm, what was number two again? Ken was the first toy ever advertised on TV? Yes. That's so weird. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm with Robsy. I think three. What, what do the people say? Uh, let's see, we've got, uh, Pete was saying one, my wife is saying two, a lot of people are saying three. Uh, we've got yes. two again. Ride with us, three. <laughs> uh, looks like the three. Uh, it's actually number two was the false one. Um, yeah, February used to be the last month. Uh, you're right about the, the Julius Caesar bit, but it was still the, yeah, it was still the last month. And so anyway, uh, but Barbie's Ken was actually not the first. It was Mr. Potato Head was the first toy advertised on television. Okay. Mr. Potato Head. Yes. So. Uh, sure. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's what, that's what made the cut. Yeah. Um, so here's our other three. In okay. Utah, it is illegal to swear in front of a dead person. Believe it. Yeah. There's a lot of weird, there's a lot of weird laws in the country about, yeah. yes, I'm going to believe that. One for okay. Sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, but did you know that a snail can have 25,000 teeth? Okay. And did you, and did you know, and did you know, NBC's The Office actually was going to start out as a four-camera laugh track sitcom before being threatened to be pulled by the original creator, Ricky Gervais. Oh, geez, I, I feel like, like I know Office. so much about The Office, but I don't know that I know that. The American Office? That's what that is? Yeah, so yeah, NBC's yeah, yeah. The Office, like NBC's The Office, started out as a, was going to start out as a four-laugh track sitcom before being threatened to be pulled. Well, like, and then Ricky, Ricky Gervais was not on board with that. Yeah, it basically was like, no. I've never heard that. Have you heard that? No. I listen to the Office Ladies podcast and everything. Uh, I'm going to say two. There's no way snails have that many teeth. They probably have some teeth. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to check Facebook, too. Any, any teeth is too many teeth. <laughs> um, <laughs> For a snail. Let's see. I've got, uh, I've got a couple people uh, on Facebook. I see two. What was one? Um, one was uh, – I don't remember. But oh, we, yeah, the Utahs. Yeah, 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 the dead person thing. We, 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 I mean, that could be a law. That could be a law in some state. Like North <laughs> Carolina, you can't walk your elephant past five, I think. Utah, brother. Yeah. I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of one. A lot of one. Uh, I, I, see, two. I see two. I'm I got one, on two. Train. Okay. All right. So, one, two. all right. We Locking got a lot out. of ones on here. Okay. Which – you so got to know me or Robsy, one of us will be right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's actually so three is the falsehood. I made no! <laughs> I made that up today. Um all right. And so, but yeah, wait, so wait. Snails have how many teeth? Can have up to twenty five thousand feet. They twenty five thousand teeth. Um it's usually in the range of like fifteen thousand oh, okay. or so, but they a lot of them can have up to four or five. Yeah. And so many teeth. And then Utah, yeah, it's obviously they have weird laws in Utah. So that was it. All right, y'all clap it up for Jacob and his random facts. I got a Kevin on an office. He did get I, pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I never heard that, but I didn't want to believe that the snail thing could be true. That's, that's mainly what that boiled down to. Oh, man. Well, hey, Crave. It's really good to see you. Uh, we are live on Facebook. We are live on Instagram. And we are also Zooming over here. Uh, so if you would rather Zoom with us, I don't know why. Uh, we, we started doing Zoom just in case anybody maybe doesn't have social media. Uh, so if you have friends uh, in your small group or just that you know of at Crave who don't have 
social media. Uh, we are Zooming, so you can get your your pass, if you will, the meeting ID and the password. You can get that from your small group leader. I've shared that with them. Not going to put that on social media because I've seen what happens to other youth groups. So if you're interested, reach out, let us know. Uh, today, uh, after a rousing game of Liar Liar in which I got everything wrong, uh, we're going to wrap up our series, Mythbusters. Uh, so we've been taking a look at some commonly held beliefs that are in fact false. Uh, and so I started off a couple weeks ago talking about God's children versus God's creation. Uh, Robsy came back last week and, and drove home the point that really we need God. Um, he will, in fact, give us more than we can handle uh, because he wants us to rely on him. And today, uh, the myth that we're going to bust might sting a little bit. Um, it's a sensitive issue. We're going to talk about death today. So uh, spoiler, trigger warning, uh, this can be kind of a difficult topic. Uh, but here, here's the reality. It comes for us all. And, and something I've prayed throughout this time of, of being home with the coronavirus and everything that's going on with that is that we would each be confronted with our own mortality. The fact that we're not invincible. There is something about being younger that makes you feel like, man, like I'm, I'm good, right? And so really before we even get to our main myth, and I'll let you know when we get there, I've got, I've got several, several sub myths that I want to touch on. And the first one is this, and it's not something that I think any of us would actually say out loud. Um, I don't think we're so arrogant that, that we would vocalize or verbalize this, but here's the myth that we, that we live and, and believe in our hearts and our minds that, that I'll never die or that it'll be a long, long time from now when I finally die. Here's the deal. One day you will stand before Jesus. It's going to happen. Like that's, that's biblical truth. Hebrews 9, 27, if you want to go look this up, says, just as each person is destined to die, and after that comes the judgment. So all of us, unless you are living when Jesus returns, you're going to die, and you're going to stand before God. But we functionally, we, we, we live like it's not going to happen. Now, we know, like intellectually, well, yeah, we know that. But we live as if it's not true. We live like, oh, man, I, I've, got, I've got all the time in the world. This is never, never going to happen to me. Or we at least think it's going to be a long, long time. I'm going to sneeze right now. Yeah, it's happening. You guys, the allergies. Oh man, I ran out of Claritin as well. <laughs> Let's make a CBS run. So sorry, but we, we we live like it's not coming for us, and if it is, it's not coming anytime soon. The reality is, we have no guarantee of tomorrow. None of us. Like, I don't have a special guarantee as a pastor. Like, oh, well, you have a special relationship with God. You're No, I'm not guaranteed anything. Neither are you. The Bible actually says that your life is like a vapor. It's here one second, and then it's gone. So we have no guarantee. You will one day at some point, whether that's tomorrow or whether that's a million tomorrows away, one day you're going to stand before God. And so you have to, you have to wrestle with, am I ready for this? Do I grasp that this is, in fact, a reality? Um, so think about that. Now we're coming to our main myth. All right. It comes from what I think is a, a well-intentioned, but ill-informed place, well-intentioned, but ill-informed. And what I would say is that doesn't make it right, nor does it really make it helpful. I would ask you to think about how many times in your life you've had the best of intentions and yet things still went completely sideways, got all kinds of jacked up. It wasn't great. So just because something's well-intentioned doesn't mean that it's right or accurate. Uh, there's an old expression that says the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. Like we have the best of intentions, but the reality is sometimes we're, we're, we miss the mark. We're off. And so here's the myth. You've probably heard it. If, you, if you've ever known somebody who died or even somebody kind of distantly, um, the myth is this. Someone will say, well, God needed another angel, right? God just needed another angel up in heaven. And that's why this person died. Here's what I would say to you. I've had people say that to me. I've heard it said to others. I personally have lost my father, my grandmother, and my grandfather. And so I, I've been in this situation many times myself. Uh, and this is it's just not scripturally correct. It's, it's not supported by the Bible that God needed another angel. In fact, that's four words. God needed another angel. You could break that down in just the first half of that sentence is a myth. God needed. Lean in with me for a second. God doesn't need anything from you. He, he just doesn't. You're not so special that you have something that God needs. God loves you and he wants a relationship with you, but God's complete and, and good by himself. He, like, he has no need for our praise. He doesn't have, you guys remember Tinkerbell, right? The Tinkerbell effect, like you, you have to have enough people believe in you, Tinkerbell, so that you, can, so that you can come back to life, so you can live. God doesn't need that. 
He doesn't need anything. He is perfect and complete and always has been and always will be. So God doesn't need anything, much less another angel to come like help pour out the rain. Now, again, it's well-intentioned. People who have said this, maybe you've heard somebody say this, like, you know, maybe you've even said it. So I'm sorry, one of my friends is blowing me up. I got I to gotta remember to put my phone on Do Not Disturb. You know what? I can do that right now. Bam. Now we're on Do Not Disturb. No more texts from my buddy. Uh, God doesn't need another angel. And here's the, here's the reality. None of us become angels when we die, okay? We don't become angels when we die. Again, there's nothing in Scripture that supports this. We think this because we've seen it in movies or TV shows or a holiday special, but there's nothing in all 66 books of the Bible that would support this as a belief system. We do not become angels. That's Hollywood. And so I would just challenge you, Crave student, to look at society and media and all the things that you can consume from this world through the lens of scripture. We talk about this often. If instead you take everything into your mind from this world and then try to look at the Bible, you're going to be very confused. You're going to have a lot of questions about who's right versus understanding that God's word is the absolute truth. And we take that and then we look at everything that the world would say and we look at it through that lens. So don't, don't get Hollywood with their picture of a halo and a, the white toga and a harp lounging on some clouds with your wings. That's, that's not something that's supported biblically. Now that might bum you out. You're like, I have always wanted to fly. And if I can't fly, what is this all even about? Well, it's about being with Jesus more on that in a little bit. But what I would say to you is this is good news because you are higher in the pecking order than angels, right? Like, in, in order of seniority, one day in eternity, we will be above angels like, oh, man, I want to be an angel. No, no, no. You get to be something far better. Romans chapter 8, you can look at verse 17 on this. In fact, a lot of this chapter talks about what we inherit in Christ, but specifically Romans eight seventeen says, since we are his children, going back to week one, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. So here's the good thing. That's never said about the angels ever. In fact, what the Bible says specifically in 1 Corinthians 6 is that one day we, as co-heirs with Christ, will judge angels. Like we will sit above them in judgment. So you will not become an angel when you die. I'm sorry if that burst your bubble. What you have coming is far better, far, far better. But what is coming? Let's unpack that a little bit. Maybe you think when we die, we become some kind of force ghost, or you're like hovering around like a Patronus and Harry Potter or something. That is not accurate at all. We will have physical bodies in the next life. If you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to look at the first five verses. I've got mine here on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, we see Paul speak pretty thoroughly about what it's going to be like for us in eternity, distinctly not as angels. Beginning in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, says, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. An eternal body. That's awesome. Verse 2, we grow weary in our present bodies. Somebody said amen out there. I know it. And we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing, for we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. So that's what I was just talking about. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that will clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying, hey, something better is coming. Now, he talks a lot about these bodies and groaning and sighing, and I'll be 34 next month. And I when I tell people this, often people older than me are like, well, oh, just wait. Yeah, I, no, I get it. That's what, I, that's what I'm afraid of. I hurt, okay? I have a lot of aches. I have a lot of pains. I've played sports my whole life. I've abused my ankles. I've blown things out. I've torn things. Like, sometimes I wake up in the morning, and my back just hurts, and I, like, I waddle into the bathroom, and Julie kind of laughs at me, and I guess it probably does look pretty funny, but my body hurts, right? And maybe you have some of that, right? Like maybe you've got just some aches and some pains and some dings and some dangs and like, it just, it just hurts. Um, and if I'm honest with you, <laughs> y'all, sometimes life happens. If you want to know what just happened, hit me up offline. We just, 
We just have somebody come cruising through. It was very interesting. Uh, ask me later. It didn't come through up there. It did, yeah, I was, I, I, was, I was trying to, like, lean in so no one could see. <laughs> These are the things that happen when you're live outside of South Campus instead of being live inside South Campus. Nobody would make it past, like, Robert McKenzie in the back of the room. Anyway, where was I? Yeah, you got to come back. Got to come back. Here's the thing. One day, if you are a believer, you get a new body. Now, what's it going to look like? Well, I still look the same. I don't know. I have no idea. I hope I have a better hairline in glory, but probably I won't. Like what I do know, what this passage says is that, that we get an eternal body that God himself made. God himself made it. He didn't outsource it to some third world sweatshop. Okay. God himself crafted you a new body. That's awesome. Like that sounds great to me because this old one, it's falling apart. And it's not that, this, this passage says, not that, I, not that I'm anxious to be done with this one. I love my life. I love my, my wife and my son. And I can't wait to meet my other son. I love my coworkers in this church and all the things I get to experience. But man, I am also looking forward to being with God in eternity forever. Now, as we think about that, I want to shed a little bit of light on what that'll be like because there's kind of, I think, another misunderstanding, another myth we can bust because we spend an awful lot of time talking about going to heaven, going to heaven, being in heaven, being in heaven. And the reality is that's not where we will ultimately, eternally be. And you're like, whoa, that sounds crazy. What is he about to say? Well, if you still got your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation 21. That's the very last book in your Bible. If you turn all the way to the maps and then take like a slight left, like maybe two or three pages, Revelation 21, this is a description of what things are going to be like in the end, like the for real end. This is what it says. Revelation 21, verse one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All of these things are gone forever. Don't miss this. And that's a beautiful passage and we love to fixate on verse four. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. And that's great. That's, that sounds really, really good, especially in the middle of a crazy coronavirus quarantine lockdown season like this. Don't miss what it says here that the old earth, this one, the old heaven will pass away and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And it just, what John's writing and describing is heaven coming down and God making his home on this new earth among his people. What's the new earth going to look like? I have no idea. I imagine, and this is just my opinion, just my imagination. I imagine it's a lot like this one, but without all of the bad stuff that has happened to our planet over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The Bible talks about all of creation groaning, waiting anxiously for restoration. I think the new earth is going to be beautiful. Think of, think of the most beautiful places you see when you watch like a National Geographic or something like that. I hope those places are still there. I hope I get to go to those places on the new earth in eternity with Jesus. And I don't have to rush because I've got all of eternity to go. And Jesus will come hang out with me. And I'll get to go see like the Grand Canyon. That's awesome. I've never seen it. Like there are all these things I want to, to experience. And the Bible says that there'll be a new earth. It'll be perfect. And just like God handcrafts you a new body, he's going to handcraft this new earth. And so it's not fully wrong to talk about going to heaven. But we have to understand that, that heaven, if, if we want to be honest, is being where God is. And we're going to be with him forever in the new earth as the holy city Jerusalem comes down and is here. Now, talk about all that and you're like okay it seems like you know mostly it's semantics that you're kind of dispelling kevin it's all you know you know okay maybe we're not angels but we will be in eternity and maybe it's not heaven it's a new earth but like what does that matter for me i'm glad you asked thank you for playing along let me tell you you need to consider your future now because something else i've observed when someone passes away this is a myth and, and this one gets this one gets a little little touchy Think about when you've heard other people speak of someone who's passed on. Never say anything bad about them? Probably not. It's kind of a cultural norm, like we don't want to speak ill of the dead. But what I've observed is a lot of people will act like whoever that person is, 
was a saint. Like they were just the best person who ever lived. And of course they're with Jesus now forever. But what we talked about a couple of weeks ago is that not everybody's ultimately going to make it to heaven and ultimately to the new earth. We're not all going to be with Jesus forever. And I don't say that to try to get you to, to question a decision you made that was genuine somewhere back along the way. I don't want you to lay awake at night and be worried. Like, oh, am I, am I in or am I out? Like, that's not it. But I do want you to hear me say eternity is coming and we are so fixated on what's right in front of us. So many of us get so caught up in our summer. Like, what am I doing this summer? Is everything going to go back to normal so I can have my normal summer or, or, you think, well, I'm not so short-sighted. I've got a 10-year plan. And man, you are laser focused on that 10-year plan. I'm going to go to a good school, get a good job, find somebody to marry, settle down, have the white picket fence, the house, the 2.5 kids, the dog, the cat, the whole nine yards. You're so focused on your 10-year plan. You're not thinking about your 10,000-year plan. You're not thinking about what's going to happen in eternity. Paul tells us that we should set our sights on the realities of heaven. The fact that this life will end and another life is coming. Are you ready for that? Jacob and I were talking a little bit before this just about uh, some of the scare tactics that we've seen over the years. And, and people will try to kind of a turn or burn approach like, uh, if you die tonight, do you know you go to heaven? Uh, please, please don't, <laughs> don't freak out. But I would ask you to consider if you were to stand before God today and you will stand before him, like at some point it's going to happen. Are you ready for that conversation? Like, can you look at this life and say, you know what? I trusted Jesus and, and I made a lot of mistakes, but, but I trusted Jesus and, and that's all I could do. That's what I can say, man, I'm nowhere close to perfect. I make a million mistakes every day. But what I know is I'm not dependent for my eternity, for my eternal home and security on my own efforts. It's Jesus who loved me so much that he died in my place so that I could have life, not just abundant life in this life, but eternal life ultimately. Are you ready for that? Have you thought about your eternity and what that's going to be like? If you haven't, I encourage you to. If you know that you have, but you have friends or family who have not, what would it look like for you to have a Jesus-centered conversation? And I'm not saying you got to come out and just start beating them with some Old Testament passages about locusts or frogs or plagues. Like, but could you have a faith-based conversation? When's the last time you had a conversation that was faith-based with somebody maybe not in your small group, not at church, not in your Zoom session you'll have with your small group leaders today or tomorrow? When's the last time you brought Jesus intentionally into a conversation? That scares me. I don't know how to do that. Pray on it. Think on it. Ask me. Reach out and say, hey, what are some natural ways I can, I can bring up my faith? Man, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Jacob Robsy would love to have that conversation with you. We'd love to give you some tips. And listen, we're not experts. It's something we have to think about too. But don't miss the fact that eternity is coming and we should be ready. And when you get that right, you don't have to be scared. Like, I don't want to die. Please don't mistake what I'm saying. I love my life, but I'm ready for the next one. Like, I, if my time is today, if I get in my little Honda Fit and as I'm driving back to my house, that's it for me good. I don't want to go. Makes me emotional to think about, but, but I'm good. I'm ready. Think on that. If you, as you begin to look inside, you have some questions, reach out, have a conversation with your small group leader, with a peer in your small group, your parents, one of us. We'd love to talk with you about these things. Listen, you're not going to become an angel, but you get to be something far better. You get to rule and reign with Christ in eternity if Jesus is Lord and Savior. So, Settle that business today. There's no day like today. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. So don't wait. All right, let me pray for us. And I'll give you just a few announcements. God, thank you that this life is not all there is. Thank you there's a hope and a future prepared for us. God, you tell us in John 14 that, that you are preparing a place specifically for us. We've read in your word today how you have handcrafted a brand new body, an eternal body for us. Thank you for this. Thank you for loving us this way. My prayers for every student watching right now, for every adult leader, for every parent, God, that you would just give them clear vision as they look within their own life. That they would be able to, to rest in the assurance of the decision they've made to follow you as Lord and Savior, or that, God, your Holy Spirit would begin to knock on the door of their heart and prompt them towards you. God, I pray that we wouldn't be so short-sighted that all we think about is what's right in front of us, but that we would consider 
the life that's to come because it is coming. God, we thank you for everything you've given to us. Most of all, your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, a couple of announcements for you. Uh, we'll be back this week. We've got stuff coming out every day. Uh, tomorrow night at five o'clock, we have words of wisdom. We've got some special guests this week. I'm still working on lining up two of those, but we've got some guests lined up for this week. I'm really excited about that. Uh, so that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, live at five. We're talking five to seven minutes. So jump on with us. We'd love to see you. Uh, you can interact with our guests. It'll be great. Um, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we've got a devotion series coming your way. This week it's called Tackling Temptation. Um, why does it seem to be based on sports? Because I really miss sports, and that's what I wanted to name it. It's alliterative, and that's where I'm at in my life right now. So Tackling Temptation, if you've ever wondered, like, hey, how do I deal with some of this stuff? I feel tempted all the time. I'm at home all the time. I, you know, what do I do? Tune in this week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday at 1130. It'll be me, Rob Z, then me again. Uh, so that'll get you through Saturday. Next Sunday, we'll be back right here. Uh, we're starting a new series that Rob is going to kick off. So I hope that you'll tune in and join us next week for a series called Straight Out of Context. Um, it's going to be great. That's an idea Rob Z had a while back, so I'm excited about that. Uh, last thing, if I could just ask you to be praying for a couple of things, uh, really three. Uh, one, be praying for our leadership. And I mean that both right up here in this building, our senior pastors, as they're trying, trying to decide and, and discern what's next for us as a church, as we're thinking about when we come back and, and all of those things as, as slowly but surely things are opening up, be praying for our, our leadership team. And, and let me just save you a message of, of you texting me or DMing this account to say, hey, like, when are we coming back? I don't know yet. But when we know, we will let you know because we are just as excited to see you as you are to see us. Uh, so that's one. Two, uh, I would ask you to be praying. We have several staff members uh, who have family members who are going through some health issues, and I won't name all of them right now. Uh, I'm going to try to get some, some clarity on what I can share this week, um, but please be praying for those people. Uh, there are a lot of different things going on, so uh, just pray for our, our Brookwood family, for everybody who's having health issues. I think that'd be great, and then last uh, but definitely not least to me, uh, my good friend Jordan Berger and his wife Emily are pregnant. Well, Emily's pregnant. Um, Jordan is not. But uh, Emily is going into the hospital tomorrow. Um, and so she's going to be having this baby uh, sometime this week. And so would you please, please, please be praying for Jordan and Emily um, as they head to the hospital, as they bring baby Josiah into the world, that it would go smoothly, that God would be with the doctors, the nurses, with Emily, with Jordan. Um, Emily, as she's doing, you know, the hard work, Jordan, that he wouldn't pass out. So pray for those things. And yeah. Uh, I'm so happy for them too. I see Hannah Lund saying that down there. So be praying for them. Uh, I love you. I miss you. I'm praying for you. You guys be safe. Wash your hands. And hopefully, hopefully, we'll see you very soon. Bye.